Ladies and gentlemen, let's come to the second topic of this uh, chapter about uh, tsunamis. We haven't talked in much detail yet. Here you see an aerial photograph of the uh, 2011 Honshu tsunami following a mega earthquake offshore right at the moment when it uh, is hitting and flooding the coastline in northern Japan. Also due to uh, good warning systems, uh, the uh, Japanese are very well set up for uh, dealing with earthquakes. And these, these warning systems that they have implemented avoided massive loss of life. Uh, many areas could be evacuated before the tsunami hit, but not all of them, and still there are about 11,000 or 12,000 lives lost in this event. Another serious uh, side effect or uh, effect of this tsunami was the flooding of the pumping facilities in the Fukushima nuclear power plants, which uh, as a secondary effect led to the uh, meltdown of the nuclear core in several reactors. And the aftermath uh, of this has not yet entirely been dealt with uh, even two years after the event. And it will probably take another few years before uh, the uh, the nuclear contamination is uh, effectively dealt with in Fukushima. Uh, another devastating uh, tsunami followed a large earthquake in uh, 2004 on Boxing Day, 26th of December, in the Andaman Sea, which we see here between uh, India and uh, Thailand, Sumatra in this area. Uh, this was a much more devastating uh, tsunami because uh, more than 275,000 lives were lost. Essentially, um, people who are, were making holiday in, uh, in these beautiful beach resorts in that region and also ob obviously people who uh, happen to live uh, close to the flood lines, uh, very low levels close to the beach in this region. This was the third largest um, earthquake recorded with modern instruments uh, for more than 100 years. And uh, there were a large number of aftershocks, uh, including one in March 2005, three months after the event, uh, magnitude 8.6, uh, probably the largest aftershock that uh, ever was re recorded in, in history. Here we see in principle the uh, situation. There is a subduction zone between the oceanic part of the Indian plate and also the oceanic part of the Australian plate, uh, both of which move with about six centimeters uh, north northeastwards. And these oceanic lithospheres are subducted underneath these uh, margins, these continental and oceanic margins, as, as we will see uh, in the next slide. The, uh, 2004 epicenter uh, was here in this region, close to the northern coast of, of Sumatra. Here we see the situation uh, in more detail. We see here plate boundaries indicated, and uh, we see here that along the subduction zone uh, we have the subduction, that is the Sunda Trench. Plate motion, as we have seen, is north-northeast, and uh, here we see that the subduction occurs here underneath the Sumatra uh, continental Sunda plate here in the south, but further in the north here, subduction occurs uh, under a oceanic plate, and this is the Burma microplate that is generated along this mid-oceanic ridge that we see here, separating it from the Andaman Sea and the Sunda plate, which also has here a small oceanic portion. We see here some names that have come up in 2004 repeatedly as uh, areas that have suffered uh, quite substantially, Phuket, Fifi, and specifically Banda Aceh here, very close to the hypocenter. Here in darker blue, we see the main um, flow direction of the tsunami and the um, worst affected areas in Sri Lanka, in India, and also here in uh, uh, Thailand and of course here, northern Sumatra, right next to it. The um, earthquake followed a long-term buildup of stress, uh, which was instantly released in a mega thrust fault event uh, without uh, preceding uh, foreshocks. So this was uh, an earthquake that started with the biggest event. Uh, the hypocenter was about 50 kilometers off the coast here. This is roughly 50 kilometers uh, off the coast and in a depth of uh, 30 kilometers. 
that is pretty close to the interface of the subducting uh, Australian and uh, Indian Oceanic plates underneath uh, this margin, this uh, Burma microplate and further back here, the uh, Sunda plate. The main shock that started here on the 26th of December 2004 uh, propagated and triggered a lot of uh, aftershocks. These aftershocks are indicated here, but these are only the biggest one and very few. There were many, many more, as we will see later. Uh, these aftershocks were propagating along the interface between the uh, subducting plate and the overriding plate. Uh, within minutes, in, in fact, uh, many earthquakes were triggered, releasing stress along this interface, which obviously had a long time history of stick, and then the slip was initiated by the main shock. When we look at the uh, displacement that occurred, uh, we have a very substantial, a large displacement uh, near the hypocenter, 20 meters offset, and that was achieved in about three minutes. And uh, equally in these three minutes, uh, we had the entire southern Burma plate here, this region, slipping by more than 10 meters on average. This is an area of uh, 400 by 100 kilometers, a very large area in size that uh, is almost as, uh, as large as the Eastern Cape province. And uh, imagine the Eastern Cape province uh, would move by 10 meters within three minutes, obviously. This would be an event that uh, would cause substantial uh, damage uh, wherever you are. In the first week, there were 13 major aftershocks uh, exceeding the magnitude of 6, going up to 7.1, and as mentioned before, a large aftershock. 8.6 in magnitude uh, happened uh, three months after the event uh, in the same region down here. Here we see a graphical is illustration of the uh, situation. At the time we see here the overriding Sunda plate, this area here, on top of the India plate and this is the fault, the subduction zone um, that got stuck, that had a long period of stick and this bent down elastically the front of the Sunda plate. We see here in with the dashed line the uh, stressed uh, pre-seismic situation and uh, the unstressed uh, post-seismic situation that we see here as a solid line, that is what we see now, that was restored within three minutes and uh, this uplift that we see here and also the snapping outward into the oceanic water that caused this massive tsunami that uh, was so de devastating in this whole region. We have seen a uh, video clip in the last lecture or in the lecture before uh, that illustrates this snapping and the uplift and subsidence effects that are associated with uh, this type of earthquake. I'm not going to show here the animation of uh, this tsunami right here, but you, you can uh, actually have a look at the Jackal server where a number of related uh, video clips are shown, including one that illustrates the uh, earthquake and the tsunami animation. Here we see a uh, geophysical recording of various earthquakes. Uh, we see here these um, uh, symbols that illustrate what nature the earthquake would, uh, would be. We see here the focal mechanism solutions that would recall these types of symbols here and their size illustrates or correlates with the magnitude of the earthquake. Here is the main shock from the Boxing Day event. Here is the large aftershock uh, from March 2005. Uh, also along the same interface between the uh, overriding plate, the Sunda plate and the, the Burma plate and the subducting Indian Oceanic plate further south, the Australian plate. Uh, and uh, we, we see here the number of aftershocks with their magnitude, again only showing the bigger ones, uh, which uh, were triggered off the uh, after following the, the large earthquake here and also following the large aftershock in March. 
So why are tsunami waves actually as high as they are and so devastating and why can they reach so far inland? Uh, because um, yeah, tsunamis offshore, far away from, from, from the continental shelf, are not specifically high waves. They are usually something like maybe half a meter or a meter high and very often offshore uh, they go unnoticed by sea traffic. There are wind-driven waves which are substantially higher uh, nevertheless, these wind-driven waves uh, will never approach so far inland, inland uh, as tsunami waves can. And uh, here we see the reason why. When the seafloor moves uh, suddenly upwards uh, during a thrusting event such as the event in, uh, in, uh, off Honshu in 2011 or in the Andaman Sea in 2004, uh, a large area is uplifted at the same time, creating a wide, a very wide wave that propagates and travels very fast. Tsunami waves propagate at uh, the speed of, of uh, commercial intercontinental jets at about uh, 800 kilometers per hour. And uh, this high speed only slows down when the bottom of such a water column hits the shallow continental shelf and friction at the bottom of uh, the wave at the interface to the, to the ground would make the front of the wave slowing down while the back of the wave is still in deep water and travels fast and that means uh, that actually the back of the wave is catching up with the front of the wave and that piles up all the water that is contained here and distributed over a large area. This makes tsunami waves so high as soon as they approach the coast and if they come here into shallow water uh, this accumulation of uh, water will be intensified and this allows this uh, huge amount of water to travel very far inland at a fairly high speed. Here we see the uh, comparison between wind-driven waves which have uh, such a kind of a rolling nature uh, in fact very similar to uh, rally waves that we have been discussing in the last lecture. Uh, these waves contain fairly small amounts of water and uh, they just break at the beach and the water flows back into, into the ocean uh, not much damage is done. Here we see the wide carpet of uh, tsunami waves that hits at fairly high speed. It's slowing down towards the, the beach obviously it does not arrive at 800 kilometers per hour but uh, this immense slowing down allows the back of the tsunami wave to catch up and that uh, accumulates a lot of water. Uh, very high water waves, 10-15 meters, can occur and that causes large-scale flooding of the low-lying coastal regions. Here we see how the Sumatra tsunami propagated in uh, December 2004. It, was, it originated here along this subduction zone, above this subduction zone. And here we see time markers in hours and we see after two hours Sri Lanka and uh, southern India were hit. Uh, after five hours it was halfway through the Indian Ocean and after uh, ten hours it already had arrived in eastern Africa, Somalia and uh, northern Mozambique. After 11-12 hours it, uh, the tsunami wave moved around the Cape into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Also here, uh, Australia, southern Australia, uh, could record this tsunami. Uh, it had weakened in intensity, so I think in Somalia and Kenya one or two people were killed. Otherwise, uh, no losses of life occurred and uh, the tsunami waves were uh, nowhere near as high as they were here immediately in the vicinity of the earthquake. The waves propagated also south of Australia into the Pacific Ocean and some tsunami action was uh, recorded going through the Strait of Malacca and uh, here on a direct way into the Pacific Ocean. We have uh, two more uh, animations that illustrate this propagation, the local wave propagation in the Indian Ocean and then a global wave propagation uh, that uh, illustrates how far the effect of this tsunami could be measured. Here we see satellite images of the North Sumatra coastline which uh, highlights the uh, uh, effects of the tsunami here, the coastline before the tsunami hit, here after and here in red color we see 
the areas that actually were flooded and uh, devastated by the tsunami. Uh, here obviously we have steeper coastline where the tsunami could not um, flow over the land surface. These here are the low-lying areas. Uh, typically that's where people live. They tend not to live necessarily on, necessarily on the mountains. Here we see settlements. Here we see settlements that got destroyed during the tsunami. A few photographs here that uh, actually illustrate what happened. This is one of the tsunami waves, not the main tsunami wave that hit uh, the wave height here at Banda Arche. We see it was, I think, 15 meters. Uh, there's no chance to survive anything like that if you are in the way of the, such a, a tsunami wave. Here, uh, ships obviously could float and they were carried far inland uh, into places where they normally wouldn't belong. Uh, again, Banda Arche shoreline with more detail. You see here the pre-tsunami situation with uh, agricultural areas, with uh, the villages, uh, with bridges, and with uh, fairly well-defined shorelines. This uh, is what it was afterwards. Infrastructure largely destroyed, uh, a stripping of soil, uh, flooding of the ag agricultural plains. Uh, this indicates that here we actually have subsidence in this area and uh, this is now the current post-tsunami sea level in that area. Uh, this is obviously a very uh, catastrophic disaster uh, for the uh, local population. And you might also have a look at the uh, Honshu earthquake. We are going to do that in the uh, original lecture uh, separately, but uh, you have the software. Go and have a look at the Honshu earthquake. Thank you very much for this lecture.